Well, this is Dr. Stan here at Radio Liberty, coming to you from the hills overlooking beautiful and picturesque Monterey Bay and, and bringing you the news behind the news, the story behind the story. Hoping to convince you that reality is usually scoffed at, that illusion is usually king. But in the battle for the survival of, of Christian civilization, it's going to be reality and not illusion or delusion that's going to determine what the future will bring. And I need to remind you the views expressed here are not necessarily those of the owners, management, staff, sponsors, or supporters of the station you're listening to. They happen to be my views and... For the next hour, certainly at this time on Friday every week, we have Dr. Dennis Cuddy, who certainly was with the Reagan administration working in the Department of Education. He's taught at the university level. He's been a consultant to industry. Uh, he's a prolific writer, and we carry all of the books he has that are in print at the current time. Dr. Dennis Cuddy, uh, thank you so very much for being with us this afternoon. Thanks for having me. The The, the devil is very, very sneaky, and... Uh, I've mentioned this before, but uh, one of the tactics he used is just to make you feel everything's okay. You don't have to worry about anything, as, as Dr. Stan was saying. And therefore, what the, what he does is he he gives you a, a person who's very, very evil, let's say, you know, a Lenin or a Hitler or Genghis Khan or Attila the Hun, and they're very cruel, right? They beat you and they torture you and all this sort of stuff. Uh and then what he does is he he gets the people, whatever century it is, to see that as the evil. All right, now that's the evil. And so we need to watch out for that. Uh, however, then he does something very sneaky. He actually does the opposite, and that's how he really catches you. Uh, he gives you what you want. So well, while people are looking for some evil person to torture them uh, as the, the evil one to watch out for, what people ought to uh, be watching out for is those in government or the power elite, whoever they are, who give you what you want, what you want. It's sort of like the lesson that a, a parent gives a child who wants ice cream, and they say, no, Johnny, don't eat the ice cream. It'll spoil your dinner and so forth and so on. And sometimes, as a, as a lesson to Johnny, they say, okay, Johnny, you keep after the ice cream. All right, here's a big old pile, and you eat all you want, and, you know, the child gets sick or whatever. Because uh, apparently it seems like... Some people only learn by you know, experiencing the, the problems that the parents are trying to help them avoid. And, you know, they, they learn the lesson, unfortunately, the hard way. And so what happens to, today is, well, not, not just today, but any time, Nero. I've given Nero as an example 2,000 years ago. What did he do? He gave the people what they wanted. They wanted entertainment, and they wanted uh, a sense of power. That's why he had the Roman Colosseum built to give them circuses, he said, you know, juggling acts and and, uh, you know, uh, gladiators fighting in the sense of power by saying thumbs up or thumbs down as to whether the uh, the gladiators would die or, or not. So he gives them a sense of entertainment and power. And so uh, today, uh, rather than being a Hitlerian torturer, uh, what the power elite does is say, well, let's, let's keep them fat and happy. You know, give them a lot of uh, food to make them fat and obese. Uh, and uh, make them happy. Give them, you know, ball games, sitcoms, uh, soap operas, uh, so forth and so on. Keep them happy. And and, and through not torturing, but uh, the, the giving the people what they want, you can actually uh, control them. And that's one of the things that George Orwell was warning about in 1984, when, yes, uh, O'Brien was torturing Winston, uh, but then when Winston succumbed to it and did what O'Brien uh, wanted, he tortured him some more, and uh, O'Brien's lesson to Winston was, we don't want you to submit to us out of fear and, and, and so on. We want you to come to love Big Brother. And so that's what we, they, they're doing today. They give you certain things that you want. They, you, I, I love my cell phone. I love my credit card. You know, I, I love my computer. So it's not like, okay, people, we're going to knock your door down and come in there and grab you and, you know, put a cattle prod on you or something. No, no, no. Give the people what they want. Give them a computer. Give them a cell phone. Give them a credit card. And through these things, they either control you by a threat to withdraw them later or uh, by, you know, finding out everything you do. Uh, you, you know, intercept the cell phone call. 
uh, know what people are buying with their credit cards online and so forth. So it's a, a control mechanism that's built not on torture, but on giving people uh, what they want. And so uh, that's, that's one of the, the things that I don't think people understand today because they've been trained to recognize evil as simply a evil, torturing, uh, Hitlerian type. Even in the cartoons, you know, the, the evil person in the cartoon is the, the villain, you know, with a cloak, and he says, give me the deed to your ranch, or like that. The, the damsel in distress says, oh, no, please, like that. And so we, we have in our mind this imprint of somebody like uh, a, an agent of Satan or the devil as being an evil torturer. And therefore, a lot of people don't recognize that Satan often gets us in trouble by giving us what we want. You know, people say in the 60s, yeah, man, I want some drugs. Okay, give them some drugs. Uh, free love, you know, sex. And so I, yeah, if it feels good, do it, was a slogan back then. And so uh, it, it's it's not so much the, the evil torture you have to watch out for, because that's obvious, but rather the, the very sneaky, sly... Uh, individual or group or the parallel who manipulates us through giving us goodies. You know, give us the goodies, and then when you get the goodies, of course, you become dependent on the goodies, whether it's the welfare state or whatever it is. You become dependent on it, and you come to love Big Brother. Okay, so anyway, that's uh, that's the relevance to uh, what we what my chapters in the book, the parallel, their history and future, which are called the use of misdirection and especially the one that we've already covered, the psychological conditioning of people. And I was giving, uh, the last time I was on, uh, the chapter called Oklahoma City Bombing Anniversary. And uh, this is an example of how the, the public is told one thing. And so they think, okay, well, I understand it. And, you know, the Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols, and that was it, and the truck bomb, and, and that's that. But uh, as I was... Uh, talking about last time, I can't really prove that the Oklahoma City bombing was part of the, the secret Nazi plan about which uh, I've written. However, uh, you you need to understand how the world works. It's like Big Nev Brzezinski said, it's a grand chessboard. Uh, and it's been that way for, for many, many years. And the, the chess pieces are moved around. And the CIA, for example, their covert operations in the, uh, the uh, part of the world uh, around Pakistan, often were run through Pakistani intelligence, uh, the ISI. And uh, of interest, uh, perhaps relevant to the secret Nazi plan, is that Germany uh, was a key in helping Pakistan to get atomic weapons. And there's uh, even a, a general who's uh, today, he's, he's a somewhat respected advisor. I think his name is uh, McInerney. And he, he appears on various talk shows, hosts. Uh, with uh, shows with, uh, for example, uh, Sean Hannity. And Sean Hannity will be asking him, what do you think about this uh, plane in Malaysia? And, uh, you know, it looks like it went down to, into the Indian Ocean and so on and so on. But this general is saying, well, he's, he's very suspicious. And he went through the various reasons as to how perhaps, uh, since one of the, uh, the pilots of the plane was a real, real devotee of a strong Muslim Brotherhood leader, that perhaps one of those pilots uh, took the plane, and uh, the, the way he had his configurations and his analysis uh, had it to actually going near Pakistan, uh, and who knows, you know, for, for what purposes. So uh, anyway, he was talking about the ISI and the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, which, of course, would make it relevant to the, the secret Nazi plan of this book uh, that I have to parallel their history and future. And so, uh, w once again, the, it's the massive nature of the secret Nazi plan. It's not just, well, we're some high-level people and we've got to find out an escape route. Uh, I want to reiterate that between 200,000 and 300,000 second- and third-level Nazis went underground in Germany alone uh, during World War II. And uh, they, they would be important in carrying out the secret Nazi plan uh, for world control, as well as the, uh, a lesser number but uh, dispersing far and wide in two successive countries would be the, the sort of high-level Nazis, the SS types. And uh, they would go uh, to all, all over. They would go to Spain and Iran. Uh, Iran was very important. Egypt is very important. Turkey is very important, and so on. Now, the anniversary of uh, the Oklahoma City bombing 
is coming up. It was on the, the actual month of date was April 19th. And so that date will be coming up. And on the, the BB show, which was called Conspiracy File, uh, just a few years ago on the, the show of March 4th, 2007, it contained uh, some uh, speculation about the instigator of the bombing, and his name was Andreas Strassmeyer, uh, that he had ties to U.S. and German intelligence, is what they uh, were saying on conspiracy files. Uh, Strassmeyer had ties to, uh, for sure, to U.S. and German intelligence, and he had served uh, in the German army in the area of intelligence, including uh, disinformation, which I thought was very interesting. And his father as well, whose name was Gunther. Hold that thought, hold that thought. We'll be back in just a moment here with Dr. Cuddy. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and uh, the name Andreas Strassmeyer is certainly a name out of the past. So you sort of forget all these names of people associated with past uh, conspiracies, the Oklahoma City bombing, because there's always something new coming up. But yes, I remember Strassmeyer, and of course he eventually left. In fact, I remember certainly um, the Ambrose Evans Pritchard uh, uh, in one of his articles talked about uh, talking to Strassmeyer after Strassmeyer had gone back to Germany. And, and and Pritchard said to Strassmeyer, why don't you tell the American people the truth? And Sidney Strassmeyer's remark, the American people couldn't accept the truth. I don't know if you remember that or not, but go ahead. Uh, yeah, and uh, and uh, what people think is, well, okay, he was this uh, German guy, and he came over to Elohim City, and, uh, you know, that, that was it. But you have to look at the, uh, uh, the background and the connection. For example, uh, Strassmeyer had served in the German army, and it was in the area of intelligence, including uh, disinformation, which is very important uh, regarding Oklahoma City. And his father, whose name was Gunther, he was a member of the Hitler Youth Movement, and Andreas' grandfather was a founding member of the Nazi Party, and uh, chief of staff to German Chancellor Helmut Kohl. Uh, in addition, uh, Gunther... Uh, the father, uh, Strassmeyer, was the father of the, what we call the German reunification movement. And German reunification uh, would also play an important part in carrying out the, uh, the secret Nazi plan and the furtherance of NATO and the European Union and so forth. Uh, uh, Germany is the leading, the leading nation uh, in the EU today. And now there's a fellow named Vincent Petruski, and this fellow helped uh, Andreas Strassmeyer get into the U.S., and uh, Andreas referred to him, Vincent Petruski, as, quote, a former CIA, uh, OSS, previously, guy my father had known. Uh, it was in Berlin during World War II. So you have Strassmeyer himself talking in those terms. And uh, Petruski had been an Air Force uh, intelligence officer in the days of Vietnam in the 1960s. And in the, in the counterintelligence division in Washington, uh, D.C. Uh, in the 1970s. Uh, so he had all the right uh, buttons he could push in this thing. And he introduced Andreas to uh, a fellow from Black Mountain, North Carolina, that's the state uh, I'm from, uh, whose name was attorney uh, Kirk Lyons. Uh, and Kirk Lyons' grandfather was also a uh, founding member of the Nazi Party. So these people just seem to sort of appear. But when you start looking at their backgrounds, you start getting a sense of how all of this may be uh, part of this secret Nazi plan, which is coming about today. And now, after a Andreas is, uh, Strassmeyer's discharge from the German army uh, when he was uh, he was about 27, what he did was he flew to Washington D.C. and that was on April 7th, 1989, and that was about the same time that Oklahoma City bomber uh, Timothy <clears throat> uh, Timothy McVeigh returned from Germany after his two-week, uh, what was called a change-up program. Uh, it was an active duty assignment with the German Army. All right, so here you have uh, Timothy McVeigh on an active duty assignment with the German Army. And also about that same time, uh, McVeigh was assigned to Fort Bragg, uh, that's also a fort in North Carolina, down around the Fayetteville area. Hold that thought, Dennis. Hold that thought. We'll be back in just a moment. Well, 
Dr. Cuddy said they're going to take us back to the Oklahoma City bombing, bringing up a lot of uh, certainly names from the past we tend to forget. Uh, certainly Timothy McVeigh, of course, the man who was accused of and convicted of being responsible for the bombing, acting alone. And of course, that was simply a cover. Uh, he was simply the cover for the fact that this was an organized effort, some sort of intelligence uh, operation. But of course, the fact that Timothy McVeigh had been assigned at one time to Germany. And the Germans play an important part in this. The Nazi movement is still intact. As you know, Adolf Hitler escaped. Uh, thousands, tens of thousands, probably 10 uh, to 30,000 Nazis escaped to South America. Other uh, Nazis certainly went to Egypt. They went to Iran, all over. Uh, several hundred thousand Nazis went underground in Germany. And so it was so interesting uh, that Timothy McVeigh, uh, shortly before Oklahoma City, uh, when he was in the American military, uh, was suddenly assigned to uh, Germany and took a trip over there. Uh, was he in contact with German intelligence? We really don't know. Uh, but one of the most interesting and intriguing questions is, what happened to Timothy McVeigh's body after he died? What happened to Timothy McVeigh's body? And nobody knows where it is. Uh, suddenly, uh, we recently saw some uh, some, uh, some pictures, uh, television pictures of William Cooper. He used to do talk radio like I do. And suddenly, after suddenly the uh, Oklahoma City bombing after Timothy McVeigh had been executed. Uh, Senator William Cooper had a woman on his program, and that woman had actually witnessed the execution of Timothy McVeigh. And basically she said, uh, you know, I, I didn't know that she continued breathing after you'd been executed, after you were dead. And of course William Cooper played that uh, clip on his program day after day after day. I didn't know that you continued breathing after you were dead until, of course, they sent a SWAT team out and they killed William Cooper. And you can look it up on the Internet. If this sort of thing really does happen, and, of course, where is Timothy McVeigh's body? Well, they've got all sorts of reasons for never showing it to anybody. Go right ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, yeah, it was uh, taken to an undisclosed location. Uh, probably it wound up uh, right next to Osama bin Laden. <laughs> In, uh, in a uh, protected area or whatever. <clears throat> so uh, anyway, the, the thing is, if you look at McVeigh, you say, okay, there's McVeigh, okay, he was in the Army. Uh, all right, he, he went to some rallies here and there and so on. But when you start seeing the the interconnections, it's sort of like a Perry Mason uh, mystery novel. You know, people, uh, different people uh, may look uh, separate in you know, their activities. But when you find out that uh, all of them sort of connected at the same date in a specific town in a rural area of Iowa or something, you, you smell, you know, something's going on when, when something like that happens. And so when you see Timothy McVeigh uh, go over to the two-week change-up program, an active duty assignment with the German Army, he's involved in that. And then you see that McVeigh uh, was assigned to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, where also uh, double agent uh, Major Ali Mohammed, uh, remember him back there in the day, he worked, uh, he had worked with the CIA and the Egyptian Islamic Jihad uh, and trained members of Al Qaeda. Uh, that's where he was located. And uh, in uh, the, the town that I am, in the middle of North Carolina, if you look at uh, Steve uh, Emerson's uh, map, you see that uh, this is a locale where I am, where Islamic Jihad had its uh, sort of headquarters or a training group in this particular area. And so uh, the Islamic Jihad, you don't hear too much about them, but uh, it's an Egyptian group, and uh, they uh, were, you know, uh, part of this whole effort. Uh, Major Ali Mohammed, uh, a double agent, uh, worked for them although he's pretending, you know, to work with our, our army and the CIA and so forth. <clears throat> now, uh, McVeigh told his sister, McVeigh's sister, in a letter that he was one of uh, ten uh, selected uh, out of 400 to be a member of a, what they call a special forces secret team. He said to, quote, work for the government on the domestic as well as international front, end quote. And that included, uh, quote, helping the CIA fly drugs into the U.S. to fund many covert operations, end quote. And so that, that tale's been going on for, for a long time. It goes back to Vietnam and, and so forth. Uh, and investigator uh, Bob Fletcher 
on this uh, this very program, the same program we're on now uh, on Radio Liberty, uh, March 20th, a couple of years ago, 2012, he related that CIA operative Gary Best had supplied the Contras in Nicaragua with timing instruments that blew up C4 explosives. You know, Iran Contra was a uh, drug money for weapons deal. Remember that, and uh, was training mercenaries in uh, Azerbaijan, uh, which actually borders Iran, in the 1990s. And then Fletcher uh, then revealed that just three months before the Oklahoma City bombing, Best—that's the man, Best bought a meat company only one and a half miles from the Alfred P. Mura Federal Building in Oklahoma City, and ceremonially, on the first anniversary of the bombing of that building, filed company bankruptcy papers. Hold well, that thought. Okay, Dennis, go right ahead. Okay, so what you have is a nexus of all of these people. You've got Strasbourg, uh you have Timothy McVeigh, uh, you have uh, uh, Major Ali Mohammed, and so on, and so uh, what you uh, what you find is that they're they're spreading all over, and it becomes uh, more and more clear how this can be part of the secret Nazi plan. And uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Mr. Fletcher, Bob Fletcher, uh, talked about this uh, uh, this one particular individual uh, owning this last name was Beth, uh, a meat company only one and a half miles from the Alfred P. Morrow Federal Building, Oklahoma City, which was blown up. And I, I just think there comes a point when you when you have to say, well, this is just too much uh, to be uh, just coincidental. Uh, McVeigh also wrote to his sister uh, saying, quote, we would be government-paid assassins, end quote. So this is just, you know, him saying, yes, we're secret agents for the government. He's actually saying we would be government-paid assassins. And he wrote that letter on October 20th, 1993, uh, that was about a week after he and Terry Nichols drove from Fayetteville, Arkansas, uh, to LOM City, Oklahoma, to meet specifically Andreas Strassmeyer. So that's why they were going there, to meet Andreas Strassmeyer. Uh, now, the founder of LOM City, his name was Robert Miller, Millar, M-I-L-L-A-R, uh, quote, there's a quote more about him, was in regular contact with the FBI in the years before the bombing, the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, and that's according to uh, uh, June 31, 1997 testimony by a senior FBI agent, Peter Rickle, R-I-C-K-E-L. And another informant at Elohim City was uh, Peter Langan, L-E-N-G-A-N, and he was the leader of the Aryan, A-R-Y-A-N, Republican Army, and son of a retired U.S. Marine intelligence officer. So once again, you have this sort of intelligence connection. Now, the attorney I mentioned uh, for the state uh, where I am, uh, Kirk Lyon, he had introduced Strassmeyer to Elohim City and uh, informant uh, Carol Howe, H-O-W-E, uh, there, uh, sent uh, to her uh, BATF, means the Bureau of Alcohol. Well, hold, that, hold that thought. We'll be back in just a moment. Well, this is Dr. Stan. Dr. Cuddy's bringing up a lot of things from uh, the past that's things most people have forgotten about the Oklahoma City bombing and certainly uh, the strange death of Timothy McVeigh, the fact that at least uh, he was executed, but nobody knows where the body is. One of the people who witnessed the execution uh, said over and over again, has uh, said uh, actually on a radio program, I didn't know you continued breathing after you were dead. And William Cooper played that pro- st- statement over and over on on his radio program, till they sent a SWAT team out and killed William Cooper. And you can check all these things on the internet. And so the Dr. Cooper, Dr. Cuddy is bringing up a lot of things that had happened a long time ago. We actually have a wonderful four CD set on the Oklahoma City bombing. That's the four CD set on the Oklahoma City bombing. And basically, of course, you can go back and get all of these uh, thoughts and concepts refreshed in your mind. And I uh, suddenly, who is Andreas Strassmeyer? Why he was an agent of German intelligence, who almost it would appear to be have been uh, working very, very closely with Timothy McVeigh. And actually, I certainly I, we do at one time have the article, and we quote that in one of our newsletters. Where on that was Ambrose e- Evans Pritchard, and if you don't read Ambrose Evans Pritchard, you should. Every time I see his name, why I I um, uh, read his articles. We interviewed him a number of times when he was here in the United States, and apparently the British intelligence agencies called the 
um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the his employer, the London Telegraph, and said, pull that man out of the United States. And so he's back over in London now writing for the Telegraph. Uh, and But his articles are always fascinating. But certainly he actually called uh, uh, Strassmeyer, and he tells about the conversation. Strassmeyer, the German intelligence agent, working now, he's returned to Germany. Pritchard calls, calls him on the telephone and says, suddenly, Strassmeyer, why don't you tell the truth about what really happened in Oklahoma City? And Strassmeyer said, the American people couldn't accept the truth. The American people couldn't accept the truth. And we have the article. We had it. I'm sure we still have it on file someplace. This is the sort of thing that goes on. A Pritchard is still writing. Always read his articles if you have a chance. And pretty soon you'll begin to realize who you can trust. I don't know whether Pritchard understands the conspiracy, but he was a wonderful, wonderful reporter and very, very important in helping us to understand that we did not get the truth about the Oklahoma City bombing or very seldom get the truth about anything really going on today. We're certainly not getting the truth about what's happening over in the Ukraine. This is all staged, ladies and gentlemen. It's all staged in preparation for something big that's coming down the line. Go ahead, Dr. Cuddy. Uh, right, and we're not getting the truth about the uh, Malaysian airplane either. Uh, there's there's a, a lot. To, uh, in fact, these uh, guests that uh, Sean Hannity had on would say things like, uh, we know, uh, he knows, uh, some other facts that uh, cannot be let out at this time. And so there, there is something in the works, and it's usually that way with a powerly manipulating event. And uh, in this case of the Oklahoma City bombing, uh, attorney, uh, as I said, Kirk Lyons, had introduced Strassmeyer to Elohim City and uh, also to informant Carol Howe uh, there. Uh, and uh, they sent to her this agent, there's a BATF agent, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms uh, agent or officer, Angela Finley. Uh, she sent her 70 reports, 70 reports, within which uh, she indicated, this is uh, this is how, indicated Strassmeyer and others plan to blow up uh, federal, <clears throat> uh, federal office buildings, which would include uh, the Murrow building. So here we have 70 reports saying they intend to blow, uh, blow up this building. Now, two days uh, after the bombing, Howe uh, reminded the FBI uh, that Strassmeyer had, quote, discussed assassinations, bombings, and mass shootings. Uh, this was in a, uh, a November 28, 29, 1994 BATF report by Howe's superior, that uh, woman I mentioned, Angela Finley. Now, despite this, and despite the fact that the FBI interviewed over 20,000 witnesses regarding the bombing, Oklahoma City bombing, the FBI never interviewed Strassmeyer before he left uh, the U.S. in uh, January of 1996. Uh, and for months uh, he, before before that date, he uh, fled the U.S., stayed with uh, Kirk Lyons in uh, Black Mountain, North Carolina. So once again, you have these people connecting and interconnecting with the various suspicious elements and uh, all having sort of uh, a secret Nazi plan flavor to the thing. Now, as uh, Dr. Stan mentioned, Ambrose Evans Pritchard, in uh, his book called The Secret Life of Bill Clinton, The Unreported Stories, that was published back in 1997, he judged in that book that Strassmeyer, quote, was being protected by the Bureau, the FBI. And relevant to that, uh, ABC's uh, program, uh, 2020 is the name of their program, their uh, segment on Carol Howe, which aired February 5, 1997, that uh, show, that segment was pulled at the last minute. And when assistant uh, producer, uh, retired Marine Lieutenant Colonel uh, Roger Charles uh, saw it was never going to be aired, uh, he protested, and he was fired. He was just fired for that, for just protesting that they weren't going to use that information, that story. And he then told Evans Pritchard that a, a message uh, from this was, quote, that this story would bring the country down whatever that's supposed to mean, end quote. And so uh, Dr. Stan, uh, in his, uh, in his uh, recounting of what uh, Ambrose Evans Pritchard uh, was about, is, uh, is right on target there. And in the late spring of 1996, Evans Pritchard had a series of uh, conversations with Strassmeyer. It wasn't just you know, one meeting, a chance meeting. He had a whole series of conversations with Strassmeyer, who was in Germany at the time, in which uh, the latter, Strassmeyer, seemed to indicate 
that he worked for the American federal government, uh, but he wouldn't, you know, specifically say for whom. And then when Evans Pritchard asked Strassmeyer why he didn't come forward and tell the whole story, uh, the uh, the latter uh, seemed to indicate he would be considered, quote, a uh, provocateur who talked and manipulated others into the bombing. And so that was another reason uh, why Strassmeyer gave that he, uh, you know, just can't come forward and tell what the, uh, everything he knew. Uh, now, there is a relatively, within the last couple of years or so, a relatively new documentary regarding Oklahoma City bombing uh, called A, uh, a Noble Lie, N-O-B-L-E, A Noble Lie. And that covers uh, some of the information contained in uh, my uh, essay here in this uh, book, The Parallel the History of Future, as well as uh, evidence from uh, seismic readings and witnesses' testimony that the, uh, the Murrah building was severely damaged by more than a truck bomb of ammonium nitrate and fuel oil. They call that an ANFO, uh, A-N-F-O bomb. And a report uh, using the Eglin Air Force Base, uh, Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T, laboratory test results uh, regarding structural damage and so forth, that uh, indicated that the truck bomb explosion could not, could not have been an ANFO bomb, as uh, we've all been told. And the report was titled, uh, quote, Case Study Relating Blast Effects Test to the Event of April 19, uh, 1995, Alfred P. Murrah Building, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, sort of a long title. And it was written by a demolition expert named uh, John Culbertson. And he concluded in that, that, quote, due to these uh, conditions uh, relating to the efficiency of air blasts, in uh, destroying reinforced concrete uh, columns. That's what the the conditions mean. Due to these conditions, it is impossible to ascribe the damage that occurred on April 19, 1995, to a single truck bomb containing 4,800 pounds of ANFO. Uh, uh, It stands for ammonium nitrate fuel oil uh, mixture. And it, it must be concluded, therefore, I think, that the damage to the Murrah Building, Murrah Federal Building, is not the result of a truck bomb itself, but rather due to other factors, such as uh, locally placed charges within the building uh, itself. In fact, I I interviewed people who were actually in the building at the time, and they described the initial blast, and they dived under their desks, and then the major blast went off, uh, uh, you know, uh, about 10, 20 seconds later, and that was the one, of course, that took out the building. And so basically the outside bomb went off first, and then the major bomb went off after that. But the American people were never to understand that anymore than to understand what happened on September 11, 2000. One, but all you need to do is watch Building 7 come down. It was the hardest thing for me personally to accept the fact that this was controlled demolition. In fact, I had to watch at least 10 times Building 7 come down. And because, first of all, nobody ever asked why did they have all the cameras focused on Building 7 at that time of the afternoon. Certainly the building came down in six seconds. There was no time to set the cameras up. So they were all set up waiting to take the pictures. But when you see the pictures, you'll see how the center of the roof collapses first. And that's because they take out the, the central supports of the building so the walls will fall in. And then once you've taken out the central supports, why then you take out the base of the building and it simply collapses, a controlled demolition. Watch it happen, you'll see it. And then, of course, if you watch the South Tower come down, you see how the top of the building vaporizes before the rest of it begins to collapse. Go right ahead, Dennis. Yeah, well, yeah, and uh, many uh, many questions regarding uh, the, the Twin Towers and Building 7 and in this case, uh, many questions regarding Oklahoma City bombing uh, still have gone uh, unanswered, as well as the uh, questions I pose about uh, 9-11. And, and uh, for example, why would Strassmeyer, if he was simply on an intelligence mission for Germany, why would he become then a bombing provocateur? You know, that's, that's something you have to, to have to look into. And then Evans Pritchard uh, believes Strassmeyer was a, quote, shared asset, end quote, uh, that would be working both for uh, German intelligence and, uh, quote, on loan to the U.S. government, uh, close quote. Perhaps uh, the domestic services section of the CIA, uh, which uh, under usual procedures would pass Strassmeyer's report, uh, quote, 
to the CIA's Directorate of Operations, end quote. Now, uh, remember that in my book, uh, The Parallel and the Secret Nazi Plan, I explained there how Alan Dulles of the OSS and CIA, afterward that, uh, during and after World War II, worked with important Nazis, such as General uh, Reinhard Galen, G-E-H-L-E-N, is a German military intelligence officer, and uh, his, his organization, named the Galen Organization. And as I said before, I can't prove the Oklahoma City bombing was part of the uh, secret Nazi plan, uh, which is uh, being fulfilled today. Uh, however, the bombing, along with the 9-11 attacks, along with economic crises, uh, along with Middle Eastern and North African revolutions, I think you could uh, you could possibly consider that as uh, part uh, or helping in the uh, plan of the Parallel, uh, the Parallel, their secret Nazi plan, then ultimately their Parallel, as I explained it in the, the latest book, the Parallel, their history and future. Uh, now, a final question that perhaps uh, will never really be answered satisfactorily is whether uh, Timothy McVeigh was really executed uh, by the government. Uh, if he was, uh, you know, if he was uh, actually a government agent, perhaps. Uh, the official story was that he was executed. Uh, however, if you look at the, the video clip that um, uh, Dr. Stan has uh, seen, uh, you will see and hear Susan uh, Carlson, C-A-R-L-S-O-N. She's of a, a TV station, WLS, in Chicago. You'll see her or hear her and see her uh, saying about the execution of McVeigh, quote, the shallow breathing continued, or what appeared to be shallow breathing, even after they pronounced him dead, end quote. Uh, now, while you're reflecting on that, remember that dead people, uh, they just don't, uh, <laughs> they don't breathe, and their chest does not go uh, up and down at all. And so that's, uh, that's the conclusion of that. A uh, particular chapter in the book, and it will be succeeded by a chapter called "A Bold New World and Forces Too, po- Too Powerful." Those are two terms uh, which will come up within the book: well, "Bold New World" and the second term, "Forces uh, Too Powerful." And it, uh, at the first of this chapter, I indicate that William—I guess you pronounce it Noke, uh, K-N-O-K-E or Noki. Uh, was a founder and president of a Harvard uh, Capital Group, something called the Harvard Capital Group, uh, which advises, uh, you know, global corporations. That's that's his job. And in his book, uh, Bold New World, The Essential Roadmap to the 21st Century, and that was published in 1996, uh, Noki, uh, K-N-O-K-E, uh, he projects that, quote, in the 21st century, we will each retain our indigenous cultures our unique blend of tribal affiliation, yet our passion for the large nation-state for which our ancestors fought with their blood will dwindle to the same emotional consequences of uh, a county or a province today. And uh, a new spirit of global citizenship will evolve in its place and with it the ascendancy of global governance, In quote. So uh, these people, if you know who to look for, and watch what they say and piece the, the puzzle parts together. You can get a pretty good idea of what the plan is and how it's uh, coming to uh, fulfillment pretty much uh, all around us. Now, uh, Noki, as I mentioned at the beginning of this chapter, K-N-O-K-E, uh, Noki's uh, vision is uh, is not actually new. It was uh, That's noted by Fabian uh, and historian Arnold Toynbee, who I actually corresponded some with or uh, just a little bit. Back in uh, 1963. Now, uh, in the paper from June uh, 1931, published as a paper, but delivered as a speech, 1931, this individual, historian Arnold Toynbee, who was a member of uh, the uh, uh, Association of Helpers uh, under uh, Cecil Rhodes' Secret Society, the Society of the Elect, in this particular uh, document or speech, June 1931, he reveals, uh, actually remarked, quote, a local state may lose its sovereignty without losing those familiar features which uh, endear it to the local patriot. Such features, I mean, this is him talking, this is he talking, such features, I mean, as the local vernacular language and folklore and costume and the local monuments of the historical past. 
But if we are frank with ourselves, we shall admit that we are engaged on a deliberate and, un- and sustained and concentrated effort to impose limitations upon the sovereignty and the independence of the sovereign independent states. That, that means nations. The dragon of local sovereignty can still use its breath, I mean, pardon me, its teeth and claws when it is brought uh, to bay. Nevertheless, I believe, this is the writer, I believe that the monster is doomed to perish by our sword. The 50 or 60 local states of the world will no doubt survive as administrative conveniences, but sooner or later, sovereignty will depart from them, end quote. And of course, the whole idea is a one-world government, right. a one-world financial system, and certainly a one-world religion with the destruction of Christianity and of national sovereignty. And they tried to do something like this, you know, certainly uh, uh, under Nim- uh, Nimrod. And of course, God intervened and uh, certainly got people to speak different languages and s- separated the people. These people tend to counter uh, certainly God's plan for humanity. Our guest is Dr. Dennis Cuddy. You really need to get his books, The Power Elite, uh, and their history and their future, and The Power Elite and the Secret Nazi Plan. We'll be back in just a moment. Well, Dennis, you've got three minutes to wrap up the program. Uh, okay. Well, uh, as I said uh, back at the beginning of the program, uh, this information isn't just there to uh, you know provide entertainment. Uh, you, the listener, I would hope are, are, are using these things to alert people to how Big Brother tries to uh, tries to control us. And uh, we've given, or I've given, others have given these quotes, quote after quote after quote, by people like Richard Gardner, uh, talking about an end run around national sovereignty, uh, eroding it piece by piece. And uh, people like Strobe Talbot, who was a Rhodes Scholar, and Bill Clinton's Rhodes Scholar roommate at Oxford, uh, back in the, the late 1960s, and Strobe Talbot is saying that uh, perhaps national sovereignty is not such a great idea after all, and the case for world government is clenched. And so if you piece together all of these statements, uh, you find a pattern. Uh, there's a, a definite pattern there. And uh, Toynbee, uh, as I said, was one of the individuals pursuing Cecil Rhodes, uh, quote, as Rhodes said, quote, scheme to take the government of the whole world, end quote. And his uh, his paper, quoted from above, of course, was uh, reprinted in the uh, November uh, 1931 edition of International Affairs. Now, that's the journal of the Royal Institute uh, of uh, International Affairs, a, a, and it's, which is an outgrowth of the semi-secret roundtable groups uh, that were formed um, between 1908 and 1913, really, to further Cecil Rhodes' plan uh, for an elite uh, to uh, dominate the world, and so uh, what you hopefully what you would do is listen to these uh, discussions, uh, discuss it among your other friends, call up your local talk show host uh, in your area, and and build upon this. Uh, and it can actually be a, a, something of uh, considerable interest because, as I said, it's like uh, piecing together a puzzle. And you, you begin to see the, the larger picture the further you go into this, and you must warn. Uh, that's also part of the Bible's teachings, Ezekiel 33.8. We must be a watchman on the wall, because if we're not, and if we don't warn the people, uh, then that'll be on our head uh, that God says. And just ask yourself if you think the country's okay and you're okay and so forth. Uh, what do you think God is thinking about a people who listens a lot, but then doesn't do much to say in the abortion, the 55 or so uh, million abortions, uh, 1.1 or 1.2 uh, million abortions every year. What do you think God thinks about that? It's, it's not a guarantee. It's not a guarantee that when the days of trouble come, then America is going to be safe. Hold uh, that thought, Dennis. Hold that thought. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and Dennis is saying already what I believe very, very sincerely, and that God is very displeased with America. And certainly when we have a program here of doing over a million abortions a year, and basically don't, people don't point out this is frankly murder. Uh, this is not a matter of opinion. It's not a matter of choice. It's a matter of murder that is being facilitated by our government. Dennis, we're out of time. Parting thought, and I'll let you go. 
Well, uh, please, uh, follow the Bible's admonition. Be uh, doers, not just hearers of the Word, uh, because we, each of us is going to be held responsible for that. Amen to that. God bless you, Dennis. We'll look forward to talking again next week. Fascinating program, as always, bringing back a lot of remembrance of things past. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Okay, fine. Well, this is Dr. Stan, and basically, of course, we do carry Dr. Cuddy's books, and we have certainly all of those books that are in print, but if you haven't read his book, The Power Elite and The Secret Nazi Plan, The Power Elite, uh, Their History and Their Future, that's two books to get started with, and then, of course, uh, we hope you'll want to get that. We do have a certainly a four CD set on Oklahoma City, and you need to go back and think about that because, of course, that was a prelude to the bombing certainly of the uh, uh, the Twin Towers. And all you need to do, we actually have uh, actually three the different sets on that: nine eleven, nine eleven update, and why did the buildings come down? And in that last four CD set, why did the buildings come down? I interviewed the fellow, and his, his job, uh, he was in charge of the cleaning up of the debris of Building Seven. And I ask him, was that certainly a, certainly a sp- spontaneous collapse, or was that a controlled demolition? And he, here's a man, this is what he does full time. He says 99% chance controlled demolition. So if the night building seven was a controlled demolition, then of course the twin towers coming down was a, a, a controlled demolition. They kill those people. Oh, we, the story we've had of the planes crashing into the buildings is a lie. And all you need to do, ladies and gentlemen, is look at the original pictures of the hole in the side of the building of the Pentagon. It's about 15 feet wide and 18 feet tall. And they want you to believe, well, they tell you that a a major airliner disappeared in there. The engines, the wings, the tail, the body, all those bodies. Well, of course, we don't know there's any bodies there, but uh, we hear all sorts of stories. But the one thing we do know, and that is that no plane went in there. The other thing is, of course, what happened in Shanksville, where, of course, one of the planes hijacked that day, crashed into the ground, just nose down and crashed into the ground. But there's no debris. And you can look at the pictures. There's no debris. How do you crash a plane into the ground without debris? Oh, it suddenly buried itself. Ladies and gentlemen, how gullible do they think we are? Pretty gullible. But you need to be involved because you need to understand we're dealing with powerful demonic forces working at the highest levels of our government. Our telephone number, 1-800-544-8927. 1-800-544-8927. You need to get my book, Brotherhood of Darkness, to really understand what's going on. We've got all sorts of DVDs on, on what happened on September 11th, uh, Richard Gage's. There's from Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth has two DVDs we carry. You need to get the information. You need to help us get it out. And now we just got a new supply of Watchers 7. It's a DVD uh, going into what's going on. Lynn Marzulli's excellent DVD about the spirits of forces working behind the scene and the fact that most of what you're being told is not true. Watchers 7 by Lynn Marzulli, L.A. Marzulli, must watching for anybody who is concerned about what's going on and making preparations for the very difficult period that lies ahead. Our number 1-800-544-8927. 1-800-544-8927. Our webpage, RadioLiberty.com. RadioLiberty.com, where you can listen to our programs live four hours a day. Archive 24 hours a day. You can watch our DVDs. You can read our newsletters. Go to the section on items around the web, and we post something there every day which we think is important for you. And then please pray for America. Pray for revival. But... Pray for Radio Liberty, our provision, and our protection. Oh, 